This is the How to Write Funny podcast. I'm Scott Dickers. Today I'm talking with Seth Reese, former head writer of The Onion, now a staff writer on Late Night with Seth Meyers. How did you get into comedy? Um, I think the main way I knew I wanted to get into comedy, I was the genie in my fifth grade play Aladdin, and I did great. Everyone loved it. I love that everyone loved it. I was the biggest annoying little ham on stage, but I got laughs and it felt great. And that was pretty much it. I was pretty much set. I knew it. Yeah, you hear that story a lot, that first laugh and just how rewarding that is. It was, oh my God, it was amazing. And then I'm, the, the, and the other like sort of childhood anecdote I remember, I had gotten, cavities filled or something and I had like cotton balls in my mouth and I was like bleeding but when we got home uh, we, my mom had ordered me the Saturday Night Live 15 year anniversary special uh, it's on video cassette and she said I could watch it but if I laughed too much like blood like it would, my blood would pop or something I don't know something would happen bad in my mouth and I remember watching that and just loving it and I think like th- those two things I just remember seared in my brain is like, this is what I want to do. This is, this is what I want to do. So for you, it was about comedy in general, or was it more about performing? Uh, you know what? I think it's both. I, both. I think I d- funny ideas and executing ideas. I mean, obviously, the, the fifth grade play was just about performing. But when I saw... <clears throat> I mean, I remember... On that 15th anniversary special, um, Eddie Murphy doing the hot tub sketch. And even being young, I was like, I love how simple this is and how dumb this is. But it's carried out so flawlessly and the way it's executed brilliantly. And I was like, that's a great idea. Great idea. And I mean, I knew of James Brown and I knew sort of like around about the way his songs were. And I got it, and I thought it was I thought it was really cool, really funny. And also, uh, you know, when Dan Aykroyd's playing Julia Child, and t- to this day, to this day, I think tons of blood is always funny. I think when somebody cuts themselves and starts bleeding everywhere, I will always laugh at it. And when it, and when things go on, <clears throat> when things go on longer than they should, I always think it's funny. I. It's it's maybe to my detriment, but I will always think that's funny. Was there a lot of blood coming out of your mouth when you saw that show? Uh, not a lot of blood. I managed to I managed to keep it keep it packed. Yeah, great. Uh, so then, what steps do you start taking toward doing it yourself at that young age? Um, well, so I in seventh grade, I was a columnist for our junior high paper, the Fledgling. At what, uh, what junior high school? <laughs> Connellsville Junior High School. Where is this? Uh, I grew up in, so I grew up in Connellsville, Pennsylvania, which is 45 minutes south of Pittsburgh. Pretty rural town, about 20 minutes north of West Virginia. Um, and I wrote, I remember, oh God, I remember writing this column about uh, people going to lunch and not waiting in line properly. And how they weren't like in single file, but they were sort of stacked. And then them all convincing themselves that they were in line properly, as if they were doing the right thing when they knew they were doing the wrong thing. And I was, th- I was definitely thinking that. And I had a problem with that. And I tried to write it in a very, I wrote it in a very snarky way. And I think that's, and so I was a column and I wrote, I was a columnist for a junior high paper, and then I did this sort of the similar thing in senior high, and that's when I started, you know, getting in senior in plays and musicals and stuff like that. But, um, but then I was also a columnist for a college paper too, um, and I think I don't know, just forcing myself to. What was good about those gigs is that they forced you to write, and because you had a deadline and you knew it was going to be seen by people, so you had to get it done. Did you pay attention in English class too and get good at the actual craft of writing? No. I think I I think I only got good at writing by writing. I, I don't I can't tell you that there was a moment where I was doing grammar 
in school and doing nouns, verbs, and that sort of thing where I learned the craft and art of writing. Uh, I'm sure I make mistakes now, but I feel like I've always written just, I feel like I've written by feel and I've been lucky enough for that to have been correct. And along, and as I've gotten older along the way, learning more um, about the proper mechanics of writing. Uh, but yeah, I think just purely by writing. Were your parents educated? Did they speak properly in the home? My parents were pathetic morons. They were dumb idiots. And if they download this podcast, David and Sharon Reese are one-eyed, mouth-breathing morons. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, they were educated. I mean, but I, I will say that my my dad's they're they're, they're smart people, but <clears throat> they weren't the type to be where I grew up and how they grew up. They didn't know, hey, you should read this like Steve Martin book or you should read this Woody Allen book. That wasn't and my even my teachers. I mean, it, no one was like, "Oh, you like comedy? Uh here check out this like SJ Perlman thing." You might like no, I always, I think throughout my life, I always came to this stuff a little later than I would have liked to. Because um, in college, I, you know, I had this humor column for our college paper. And I would say it was terrible for two years. And then I started to read, I started to read the Woody Allen stuff and the Steve Martin stuff and the New Yorker and the Jack Handy stuff. And then I was like, oh, okay, this is good. And probably the next three columns after that were ripoffs of them. But it definitely took me down a path of not being annoying. I think that's my one fear in comedy writing is being annoying. And that their stuff just sort of floats. And there's not a lot. There are punchlines, but it's not banging you over the head with them. And that's when I realized I was banging people over the head. And I wanted to... So I'm wary of that now. That's a good lesson to learn from uh, good comedy writing. What else do you think you picked up from some of those masters? I th the importance of uh, maybe evergreen ideas and just, like especially with Jack Handy, calculated silliness. I mean, there's no way it doesn't take... I'm sure it takes, I know it takes Jack Handy long, uh, tons of time to write his pieces. And when I write stuff from McSweeney's or I've been fortunate enough to get some, some New Yorker stuff in, it takes me, one of them I, I started like four months ago and then I went back to it and then I went back to it. It's, it's like honed silliness. Um, I, I, or it's like, I, I like to call it like controlled chaos. So the re the reader doesn't necessarily <clears throat> know how controlled it is when they're reading it, but <clears throat> as they are reading it, they, there's a form to it. There's a build to it that was thought of for a long time before they saw it and tweaked a ton before they saw it. Right. So you sensed the the intelligence behind the words. Oh yeah. Really affected you. Also, also I mean with, and I'm not going to say anything new to any comedy nerd who's going to listen to this, but um, the way that Jack Handy sort of pops in casual language in his writing is genius. And it's not, he knows exactly what he's doing. You know, he, he gets it. Um, it's not because he's a dummy. <laughs> he's very smart. And he knows that people at that point in the rhythm of the sentence will laugh at that. Right. So, your path into comedy seems pretty direct, but I'm wondering if it was altered at all or changed in some way by um, puberty. Well, I was wondering how that was for you before and after puberty. Well, I think you, I don't know. I think you, you've, I think you've said this and I feel like I was like this in high school and junior high. You said an onion writer isn't the person in the party person outside the party making fun of everyone inside the party. I think Carol Kolb said that. She said originally. that? Yeah, I believe that's uh, what I And maybe who secretly would like to be in the party. <laughs> and right. I've always felt like that. Always. Just I, the outsider. Yeah, I've, I've always felt, I've never 
feel comfortable inside the party. I always feel more comfortable sort of snarkily making fun of everyone in the party, but also kind of secretly wishing, I wish I could be like comfortable in this party. I wish I could feel, feel comfortable standing. And I have good parents who taught me polite manners. And But there's a part of me that's not very good at small talk and who would love for people, love to be able to be great at that. But I in college, I was out of every party by like 11, 15. I was done. I couldn't be there. It was hot. It was disgusting. I was like, what are you doing? Are we having fun here? Is this actually fun for everyone? And the answer is yes, they were having fun. <laughs> and I, I just could not reason in my brain why they were having fun. Because they were starting to get drunk. But like, I just couldn't fathom it. And so I would take solace in sort of picking or just seeing the sort of social more social mores or whatever that that were happening i mean like uh classic this classic that you know here's this guy okay here you know i i that's that was the party going on in my like brain you know so i i think that's always been consistent uh maybe that maybe that started post puberty but i i didn't do it i of course i love the attention i'm not going to sit here and pretend i don't love the attention but that said I love the attention when it's good and when I know that there's like a part of me that thinks, oh, I deserve this attention because this is good and I hope people pay attention because I think it's good. It's real shitty when you get attention because it's bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, not to psychoanalyze you at all. And this is more in general. Well, this is the po- this is podcast world. Isn't that what this is for? I guess, that's <laughs> the hell else you I guess we can do that. We can do whatever we want. <laughs> sure. So I'm pretending you're Mark Maron. Humans are... <laughs> Well, actually, you should pretend I'm Charlie Rose. Oh, oh yeah, okay. This is, this is Charlie Rose. Oh, well, then I should have worn a suit. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. Just, <clears throat> just sound like you're wearing a suit. <laughs> so, humans are very social creatures. We, okay. We're mammals. We need to bond socially with other people. But a lot of people just don't have the gene to hang out at parties and make small talk and network and do all these like typical social things that other people not only do and are good at but genuinely enjoy right people look forward to they do friday night oh i get to go out with you know some people and have fun at a bar and maybe you're one of those people like me and like a lot of other comedy people i've met who my my stomach is just turned by that idea like going out to a party but Um, but i i i want to ask you this like as a comedy writer do you feel like your comedy writing gives you what other people get from social situations that you don't, such as you get um, praise, adoration, attention when you do well. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, you get to give of yourself and communicate and bring joy and laughter to people. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a part of me that's saying this, this comedy thing that I'm putting out there, this is me at my purest. If I were at this party, this is maybe what I would be saying or what I want to be talking about, but... There was no point in the conversation where I could talk like this, <laughs> you know? Um, <clears throat> I, I would say I'm, what I do like, I like a good dinner. I'm great at dinner. A I'm, one person, two people dinner? Two people, three, four people getting dinner, sitting down. I love that. I know when it starts. I know when it ends. And I know that afterwards I can leave because we've, we've probably had a good time. <laughs> um, it's 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 the it's the party aspect after, but I like in a dinner or uh, or a dinner party at a play. That's that's what I'm good. Nice controlled environment. Um, but yeah, I mean maybe I th- I think when I'm when I'm doing this stuff, it is that's exactly what I. It's my purest idea, and I'm putting it out there for people to consume. And hopefully they do, and maybe that is me, you know. That's you connecting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, but I'm not, you know, I'm not going to sit here. I think a lot of maybe comedy people like to, it's like cool to be like, um, I'm by myself and I'm this misanthrope. And I'm not, I'm not entirely like that. I just kind of go to places in my head occasionally where I'm, uh, I got to get the fuck out of here. This yeah. is not. This is enough. This is nuts. <laughs> yeah. So, besides that urge to connect, what do you suppose is the main thing that drives you 
to succeed in comedy because you're very hardworking and you you've been doing it really just I don't want to use the word aggressively, but you you've been doing comedy right. really consistently like much of your life. Was it really just to to get the joy of that laugh again, or was there something else going on? Um, a couple things. It is the it is it is absolutely the joy of the laugh. I think once you start a project, the joy that you have in the process of it, once you start it, starting is awful, it sucks, and it's hell. But once you're in it, and you're tweaking it, and you're working on it, I do like that feeling. And the feeling I'm getting when I'm doing this, and I'm like, oh, I can't wait for people to see this when it's done. I, 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 I That drives me. Also, <clears throat> uh, an inferiority complex. Absolutely. I I was cut from my seventh grade basketball team. I was cut in eighth grade. I tried out in ninth grade and I made the team. And in the movie of my life, it's like the climax of the movie of my life, making the team in ninth grade. But also there's a real sick little fuck in me that when I was cut in seventh grade and I was cut in eighth grade, I made it a point to play people who I who beat me out for the team, I made it a point to play them one-on-one -on -one in basketball and beat them. So they would know that I could beat them. <laughs> like It's proving yourself. Yeah. There's an, there's an, and the, and I think because my, because the career choice is so sort of, it's lofty. It's a lofty career choice. It's a hard career choice. It's also, my parents were always very supportive of me doing whatever I wanted, but I'm sure there was a part of them that thought, I don't think this is going to work out because this doesn't, we don't know that this works out. This is not our experience. And because I know how hard it is, I think I also wanted to prove to people that I can do this um, and then do it well. So I, I definitely there there is an inferiority complex with I think almost almost anything I do I'm a I'm a pretty com, I'm a pretty competitive person. Uh, that said, I also really love I also really love a group getting together and doing something special. Uh, there's at that point there really isn't a competitive bone in my body. Yeah, except with other groups doing another project that might face yours in the marketplace. Uh, that's, that's true. But also I, at the onion at late night and in the sketch comedy world, if somebody, th thank God I'm, I'm like this because if I wasn't, I think I'd be an awful human being, but thank God I'm like this. If somebody has a really good idea, I'm absolutely the first one to be like, that's good. We should do that. We're doing that. He had a great idea. Like, Connor has a very good idea. Um, even if my idea was in the mix, I am happy, happy to push those ideas because when you're working at, especially when you're working in the service of an institution, it does not, it, it, if the onion looks good, you look good. If late night looks good, you look good. Seth looks good. That's, and then to the world, the show looks good. That's what's important. Um, thank God I have that that gene. Whatever parent gave me that gene, thank goodness. With along with being competitive, um, and also when you said other people doing similar projects, you know there was a group when I was in a sketch comedy group called Pangea Three Thousand, and we were in we performed in New York a lot, and everyone in that group has gone on to write comedy professionally. But there was another group at the time called the Harvard Sailing Team. They're still together. So funny. And whenever you see another sketch group doing funny stuff, yeah, you're competitive, but honestly, it's really refreshing. It's it's refreshing to see them do good work. I think it's the groups that you think are awful when, when they when they succeed. That's when it's annoying. <laughs> and you feel really good when you succeed and they don't. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, you feel like, well, our excellence was recognized as right. it should and their, and their right. excellence was not as it should. Right, right. Where did you go to college? I went to Boston University. 
And then did you come to New York straight away after that? I did. And what did you take at in college? What was your major? What did your parents think you were going to be doing? Okay, so I first, I will say this. If I could do college all over again, I would have just majored in English and history and called it a day. I majored, I first started majoring in uh, journalism because in my mind, I wanted to be like the funny newscaster. Okay. And like... And then after watching Bruce Almighty, I knew I didn't want to do that. Uh, and so... Or Steve Carell did uh, it Not the then. Steve Carell one, the, the first one, the Jim Carrey one. He was like kind of like the funny... Steve Carell was in that one. He was a real newscaster, whereas Jim Carrey played the part of like the features guy who goes out. I see what you're talking yeah. about, like the funny weatherman. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I thought you were talking about, you know, because what Steve Carell did in that movie was kind of his breakout thing. It was yeah. so funny. <laughs> <when> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so funny. Um, but I did a couple internships did one internship at uh wb50 well i did one internship at radio disney boston which was the worst time in my life it sounds awful it was terrible and we had radio disney is just like a syndicate where they all play national we had to go to like parking lots and set up a moon bounce and like be on the mic while kids played in moon bounces and here's the annoying thing i wanted to be good at it (laughs) i don't I wanted to be good at it. And were you? I wa- Probably. <laughs> I'm sure you were fine. Yeah, um, I'm sure you did great. No, like, I, I, want, I wanted to be good at it. And now looking back, why did you want to be good at it? Ugh, you're so annoying. And then uh, I did an internship at the Quincy Patriot Ledger. That's so why I'm majoring in journalism, where I was writing obituaries from like for like nine hours a day. Wow. You get a fax from, uh, and I wasn't good at it. You get a fax from a, a funeral home. And then you write the obituary from the facts. So basically, it's also free advertising for funeral homes, the obituary, the local obituary section. And it was that, it was kind of around there that I was like, ugh. At BU, they had like a film and television thing. And I was like, oh, I think I want to major in film and television. But also, that's around 2002 or 2000, 2002. That's when the oral history of Saturday Night Live came out and I read that book over like Thanksgiving break and I was like this is uh, this is what I want to be doing I, I want to be doing this also at that time uh, also at that time I'm reading The Onion too I'm like this is funny like what what am I doing like this is the journalism I like <laughs> this is not journalism uh, so when I got back for back from break I changed my major to film and television um, as sort of like, this is what I want to be doing. Whether or not that ultimately helped me get to, to, to do what I'm doing, I don't, I don't think it necessarily did, but I think in my mind it was like, that's a click. Also, doing sketch comedy in college was huge. Yeah. And is that where your sketch group formed? Yes, and so lucky. Uh, honestly, college be- became the infrastructure for our sketch comedy group. We were so serious about it, and I was lucky to be in the group with guys who were doing comedy. Dan Klein, um, Arthur Meyer, Zach Poitras, um, who were we were all in the group in college together, and then we reformed when we moved to New York, and we were all serious about doing comedy professionally. And it really did well. The sketch group, as yes. sketch groups go. Oh, yes. I mean, we were the like, we did festivals. We entered festival. I mean, it was. And we did these huge semester shows. And you got and, uh, like agents and other like offers kind of came your way. Did uh, you think right? I don't know. If, no, wasn't wasn't that. But we definitely made a mark sure. when we would travel around. I think people were like, wow, that's they're very, impre- very impressive, very good for a college group. And I think we were a good group. Now, if we, wa- if we watch some of our stuff, uh, some of it's not funny. But that was... Good. It's good to be in college. You have a supportive environment around you. And you kind of, if you're writing so much in college and putting out so much comedy in college, you really get, get the crap out. A lot of crap, you get a lot of crap out. <clears throat> so that when you're done with college, you sort of have more of a home voice yeah, you than you would your, if you start when you're, when you're done with college. You put in your apprenticeship period. Yeah. And without even knowing it. Right. Which is great. And then when you guys come to New York, you don't have jobs. 
you're just you're all your energy and your ambition is focused on comedy. Do you get like temp work or do you just um, go write for some Well, of the so I work? so I did a lot of So I interned at the Late Late Show with Craig Kilborn. When was Craig Kilborn? I interned at Conan post college you interned. No, this is during oh, college during, and a little okay. post college. So yeah. Conan so Late Late Show with Craig Kilborn was the summer before my senior year of college. Uh, then I interned at Conan uh, during my winter break, my senior year of college. I interned at The Daily Show uh, right after college. So that kind of made that kind of made the move to New York a little more palpable because I had something sort of lined up. Then I was a page at Letterman, uh, and also at that time I. Around the time I started contributing to The Onion, and um, and I also did some acting. I did some like off off Broadway acting, and I wrote for I did I was in a children's theater touring play hmm. uh, based. I'm sure it was an illegal adaptation of The Giver uh, that I was in, and um, I also wrote for this show because of this thing I did in L.A. This essay reading thing I did in L.A. when I was an intern at Kilbourne, I wrote for this show called Cheap Seats hosted by the Sklar Brothers, which is sort of Mystery Science Theater 3000, but for sports. Um, I wrote for them. So how did you, I don't know if this is one answer for all, but how did you get all these internships? A lot of those are really competitive to get. Um, so Kilborn, I went to the Late Late Show webpage, and there was a section of it that said, Contact Craig. I clicked on it, and I was like, hey, are there any internships available? And I got an email back from the internship coordinator uh, saying, send me your resume and stuff. I mean, like, I knew <clears throat> that I wasn't expecting it. Uh, I wasn't expecting a response from Craig Kilborn. I was just trying to figure out some way to put some request out there. So sure enough, she got back to me. And then Christine Mason was her name. And she was an assistant for Peter LaSalle, who was, like, huge in the late night game, executive producer of Late Show with... Uh, or late night with David Letterman, um, and so then like she helped me get an internship at The Daily Show uh, when I graduated. Now, Mike Desenzo, he's he's a he's a writer at The Onion, and now he write, writes for The Tonight Show at Fallon. I helped him get an internship at Kilbourne when he was interning at Conan. So then he helped me get an internship at Conan. And when did you guys meet? Mike Desenzo and I met. Sophomore year of college. Oh, in so a, in, in a, college. Yeah, in a TV writing class. Oh, okay. Uh, and we took several TV writing classes together, and uh, we recognized in one another um, a kinship based on taste and also a kinship based on a distaste for the other people in the class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you guys helped each other out, and then he was an intern at The Onion. Right. And I remember he came to me and said, and first of all, I should say that he was – a new type of writer that we had not seen at the onion well, he's, up to that point. Well, he's part, I feel like Mike is part of the, the, the new, the new generation of onion writers. Like the who, second generation. Who, who read the onion and loved it and wanted to write for the onion. Yeah. Which was like, I feel like you guys created something you had to create based on your voice. You had to do that because whereas us, we we were like the people watching Saturday Night Live and like wanting to write for Saturday Night Live, what, reading The Onion, wanting to write for The Onion, right. um, and so, yeah. yeah, yeah. So he he was just such a hardworking and dependable writer, and a lot of the early crew were just a bunch of slackers, really, from Madison, Wisconsin. Right. And he was the first millennial. Well, he was the first millennial, first non -Gen definitely. Xer. But he was the first New Yorker, you know, person who actually lived in New York, right. who came to us via that route and there's just a an, an ambition built into the dna of a person like that that's very unlike a slacker you know generation x person from madison wisconsin right. and he came to me and said oh there's this other guy you should definitely look at his stuff you think i'm a hard worker he's 10 times what i am. <laughs> and i didn't believe it until until we brought you on i was like oh wow you weren't kidding he no. really cranks it out yeah uh, um and cranks it out poorly until it gets good yeah. Well, that's that's how you yeah. write comedy. Yeah. Right. Um, no, but Mike, what, what happened was when Mike got hired full time, another writer who had been there forever since Madison, John Cruson, said, "I want to start a sports section," 
Mike said, that's great. I know someone who can help us out. So I started freelancing for Onion Sports when Onion Sports first started. And I did that for about six months. And then I started, which was very lucky because Onion, I got in on the ground up of something that if we did it right, it was going to be successful. And I also didn't have to compete with the larger contributor pool that was freelancing for the regular Onion. So I was doing, I did regular Onion, I did Onion Sports for about six months. And then after that, I started contributing also to the regular Onion. So I was doing Onion Sports and regular Onion. I was doing pretty well, like money, like it's all relative at that point. But what I was paying in my Brooklyn apartment and like, I was like, fine. Like I didn't, you know, my lifestyle, I've never spent more than my lifestyle. So I was always thinking, I'm great. This is fine. I can do this forever, <laughs> you know? Um, and, but I, I always wanted to get hired. I mean, that was my ultimate goal. I would have done it all for free if I would have gotten hired to be a full time staff writer. So eventually I freelanced for about a year and then I got hired and Mike has been instrumental. He's, I were very loyal to one another. If he ever needed anything or if I ever needed anything, he's, we would be there for each other. So he was, instru- he was, he helped me, uh, put my name out there uh, for set for late night too. Let's drill in a little bit on something you said about how you what your process for writing comedy. You just write crappy stuff until it's good. I want to get a, uh, hopefully not anymore, but <laughs> but I'm sure yeah. I'll look back on now. The it stuff it all last comes out gold. Really I'm sure. So, but basically, what is your process for coming up with a joke and writing a joke? Like really, you know, zeros and ones. Like how does that work for you, or is it different every time? I think the best stuff comes from the best stuff comes from not when I'm just sitting down trying to think of something. The best stuff comes from just like walking around and I hear something or I see something, which is, and then I immediately write it down in my notebook. That's the best stuff, which is sort of not, it's not, if you're somebody who just wants to be in your apartment all day and not getting out in the world at all and not, it's not conducive. I mean, it's, it's antithetical to that. I mean, the best stuff happens when you're actually sort of living. Cause my, I think my best stuff comes from like recognizing what's going on in the human condition. I think that's always when I, where I've been best. And, um, so that's when a germ of an idea happens. I'll think, Oh, that's ridiculous for that. And I'll think, well, what can we do with that? And so you're noticing things that bother you, things that you can relate to, so, uh, the gamut of things. Yeah, so here's, so here's an example. I, I sort of have an idea for a, a web series that's percolating. And um, I was at the I, – I booked an impromptu trip to London. And I, had just, I just got back from London two days ago. And I was – because I, haven't been, I hadn't been there and I was tired of not having – I didn't want to be someone who didn't do things. So I wanted to do something. So I did it. But I was in the National Gallery in London and it was they were going through like Renaissance paintings and I, I think the Renaissance paintings, well, I'm sure they're done by the masters. I think they're very boring. But there was a guy, there was a British man talking to a group and what is very interesting about this painting? Uh, this is the first time it's square. Uh, and this is Jesus, blah, blah, blah. So I thought it'd be funny if the next one... and. This is Jesus eating a hoagie. What is interesting about this hoagie? This is the first hoagie where you can see the lettuce. You can actually see the lettuce. No one had ever shown that before. And I always and I thought it'd be funny if someone in the and like the group raised their hand like, what about what about uh, what about Jesus with club sandwich? You could see a little. Ah, oh, you could, but that, technically, just like getting into like. So I like that's I'd like to do something with that, and that's it happened because I decided to do something and go somewhere and be about. (laughs) And like, that's, that's when the best sort of, I think germ of ideas happen. And when you are forced to sit in front of a blank page and write from non lightning bolt strikes from walking around on the street, what kind of process do you go through then? It's like, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks. You just need to start typing. This sucks, this sucks. You need coffee. Go get coffee. Go get coffee. Drink it. This sucks. That'll coffee. Coffee will give you some spark in your brain. It just sucks. This sucks. This sucks. Okay. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I hate this. This is impossible. I can't do this. 
All right, we're gonna. I have to do this because this is what I'm getting paid for. So okay, here we go. Let's start typing. Blah blah. blah. That's not bad. It's not good, but it's not bad. But I'll leave it on the screen so at least I have one down. Okay, next. <laughs> that, that that's all. That's that's it. Until and you get hopefully a, until you get a bunch of those. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then you go back and look at them, and maybe one or two is like, oh that. Yeah, yeah. That's it. That's that's great. That's the process for writing onion headlines when you're just sitting and looking at a screen. It's the process for writing sort of gang written jokes for desk pieces at late night. You know, it's just like you're sitting at that. Yeah. You're coming up with the core concept that you're going to be executing yeah, yeah. Uh, or an idea for a sketch or whatever. So once you get hired full time at The Onion, then you become the head writer. Yeah. Uh, pretty. I mean, you, you were there like six years, I want to say. Uh, before time. I was head writer? No, total. <clears throat> total? I was the there end. for about eight years. Eight. Okay. Great. Um, including the year I freelanced. Um, okay. So yeah, I was there from, yeah, I was there for eight years. So what did that experience do for you working at The Onion? Um. Boy, I so much, so much. Uh, so, from a practical standpoint, when I got to late night, uh, I was able to produce segments, work with graphics, work with camera blocking, pretty seamlessly because of my experience doing sim doing same at the Onion, uh, and also being able to give good notes. And understanding the graphics is always there to give you exactly what you what you want. They always want to give you exactly what you want. Don't feel like you're stepping on people's toes if you're saying, ah, I don't think this is right. Let's try this. Like that's that's hard for people when they first enter these sh television shows because if when you're writing something, you're also producing something and people don't really have that production experience right off the bat. Um, from a com from a comedy standpoint, I really the recognition of a funny idea and pushing it and whoever's in charge at that point, I wasn't in charge saying this is good. 14 is good. Here's why it's good. When I say 14, it's like number our, 14, our, 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 our Tuesday pitch meeting where we just yeah. have 150 headlines in front of us. And we're saying we're picking the ones that we think would be full stories or news and briefs or something like that. 14 is good. Why is it good? Here's why it's good. It does this. I think it's cool. Um, and in those meetings, we don't pitch our own ideas. And that's something that you, that was your, that was your thing. Don't pitch your own ideas. That's, that's like masturbating in front of everyone. <laughs> so, so, um, I, I was just pitching other people's ideas and recognizing how funny they were. And also, and then when you got to be head writer, recognizing each, how each person really brings something integral to the product that if I were writing this by myself, it would be dog shit. And thank God this person's here and this person's here and this person's here. So it just keeps on breathing life into it and making it funnier. Um, but then also the onion honed something that I had always done, but I think it made it just really drilling down on something and like eating all the meat off of it until you're, until it's bone. I, that's, those are the stories I loved in the onion the most. Also, The Onion does a lot of great, uh, the inner psychology of a person and how their brain is working. They do a lot of great stories like that. And that sort of let me explore that even more. And I always find the working of the brain of who we assume to be a sane individual. Uh, ultimately, the inner workings of someone's brain and the thoughts that pops in, pop into their brain, if we all knew them constantly, we think everybody is mentally ill constantly <laughs> the onion allowed me explore to explore that yeah and that's sort of where you've always lived comedy wise you just really like that area of personal human foible i like do really I, inner brain foibles and also like sometimes i'll do like stories at ascat i'm not really great at telling stories i'll do like the monologue and ascat yeah. that they improvise from i'm not really great at the stories but when i can find when i can click into the the mental machinations that go into each decision, that's when I feel like I'm actually doing something interesting because I always find it funny. Uh, people's thought processes about anything is funny. Like even just like walking into a Best Buy, looking at a TV you want to buy, knowing you want to buy that TV, but then going to another TV, looking at it, someone comes over to help you, you say, no, I don't need help, when actually it'd be great if he just helped you. If you said, yes, I need some help, you're like, no, no, I'm fine. 
I'm just browsing. No, you're not. You're there to buy. But you just didn't want to say that because you didn't want him to like crowd your space. But actually, it'd be easier if you did. <laughs> yeah, no, just those great little moments that probably everybody experiences. Yeah. Noticing those and making a joke out of them is one of the core raw materials of comedy. Yeah. You know, Seinfeld obviously was, you know, one of the most famous to really take that and show people kind of how that's done right. when it's done really well. Yes. You've had a long career doing that in print and The Onion is well known for doing that as well. Like right. I often hear besides like the fake news making fun of current events, it's the little personal stories about that's what can, that's what, area man yeah. or whatever. Like that's people really have come to appreciate that. Right. And I think what I like to do what I like to do that I like to take, I like it for it to get absurd. I like when it starts pretty grounded and then it gets, it can kind of get insane. I like that. Whereas I think which Steinfeld is great at, he keeps it sort of, he keeps it sort of contained within the world that it's happening. I like to go to wacko land. More like Carlin. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I like to go to I like to go to Wacko Land as long as I know that I can hook people at the beginning, and then because when I was first writing those humor columns in college, it was all like observational humor about school. It wouldn't you know. get wacky. What's that? It wouldn't get wacky. It wouldn't get that wacky, and it would. And then that's when I realized, well, if it's going to get wacky, it needs to feel also uh, controlled in a way that's meticulous. Yeah, and I think that's what our sketch group Pangea Three Thousand did really well. We it was like controlled chaos on stage. Americans, as a rule, I think, don't do wacky well. We're very contained and we're very intellectual, which is so ironic given who we right. are as a culture. But the Brits have always been so much like the brilliant madcap comedy people. Right. And it's, it always kind of bugs me. We do, a, we do a segment on the show that I love. It's called Crew Poetry. And Seth says, sets it up by saying, a lot of you guys don't know this, but along with having the best crew in late night, they are also the most accomplished poets in the world. And after they do the show, a lot of them leave and write and teach poetry. So here, <laughs> here reading the poem Zoom In is our, is our cameraman, Gene Kelly. And like music plays and he turns and the lighting is different and he reads a poem about his job, but he's always introduced as like Nobel laureate, uh, like head of the national uh, curator of the national poetry foundation. And if people don't hook into that silliness early and don't get why that, why that juxtaposition is funny early, they're going to be like, what is this? Why is this happening? But if they do, they're going to love it because they're like, where did this idea come from? I love this. This is so charming and fun. I really do like charming and fun. Like I, I like comedy that kind of like is, can be a little vicious, but I really do like spectacle, especially when we're dealing with like a TV show or I love spectacle and I love silly spectacle a lot. And like that to me is just silly, dumb spectacle. We had one poem is by Charlie Friend, who's he works the spotlight in the Eagle's Nest, which is ab high above uh, the studio. Mm -hmm. So when it cut to him, there was a Phantom of the Opera sting, and he had like half a mask on, and he was and his poem was called Sky Prison. <laughs> it was just about him how he was tucked away, and he couldn't come down, but he had to shine the light on other people, and just like him feel like, feeling that about his job. I loved, I loved it, because also like those the crew guys are the best. They're so funny. They're so normal. You don't cast those people. There's normal people. And yeah. that's, that's so funny. You can't get that kind of yeah. unwitting funniness yeah. out and of there's, a, an actor. And there's a certain flatness to their yeah. to their read, which is great. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's something that I'm glad to hear you say you like because it's something I think Tim and Eric really got good at. Yeah. Is finding normal people who didn't have any on camera experience. Right to be these incredibly unwittingly funny on-camera personalities. And then they would mix them with really good actors like a John C. Riley right. who was playing a person who right. was unwittingly funny because they didn't have any on-camera experience. What is, what is it about that unpreparedness that's so funny? It's, it's, there's no artifice. It's like 
it's totally it's real. real. You it's feel like people are connecting. Yeah, on a human these are level. totally like real people. I think if you, if the segment is done well, these are totally real people who are plucked by these writers and told to say these things, and <laughs> and, and and they have to say these things. So you're feeling a little bit of that visceral fear of a real person having to go up and yes, read some lines. exactly. And I and I, you know, Seth Meyers and I have talked about this too. I, I really do think the best or some of the most rewarding stage comedy is when there is a tension between the performer and the audience and that could fall either way. It could fall on the side of them not getting it, in which case it sucks and it's going to be painful. The whole thing is going to be very, it's going to be four minutes of pain. But when it falls on the other side, if that tension just clicks to the right where they get it, it's the best. That tension is absolutely rewarded. That's the best. That what well, in terms of stage comedy and performing for a live audience, that you cannot beat that. Did I love and I love that tension. I really do. Yeah. Did you see some of that happening when you interned at Letterman? Was he still doing things with like Biff Henderson and crew members? <sighs> yeah. Well, he all he always did stuff with Biff. I, Biff, but the one thing that I always he wasn't doing as much of it, but. One thing he, I think he debuted when I was a page there was, uh, this is the type of bit I love. It was putting away the late show bear. Uh-huh. And he, Dave Letterman would explain, so this, this bear, he's, uh, he's aphasia, I think is the word. And it's like, he's, he's hungry and we have to put him away and he's, he's scary. And he's, so each clip would be like, it'd be like Elvis Costello walking down the basement of like the late show and then the bear would appear and whoa, like roar and Elvis Costello would have to wrestle the bear into like this door, close it. And every, the bit always ended with like Elvis Costello or whoever the celebrity was leaning there, leaning back against the door and like wiping sweat off their forehead. Be like, whew, that was close. <laughs> like, and I, I love that. And I'm sure some people watched that and were like, this is dumb. This is a dumb 30 seconds. But to me, I was like, that's a brilliant 30 seconds. And what was brilliant about it? Was it well, specifically? First, how short it was is one thing. How brilliant it is. I think the idea is so like, where did they come up with that? Total non sequitur. Total non sequitur. And total non sequitur within a lot of sequiturs. This thing. Here's a monologue. Here's this. Here's this. Oh, by the way, we have this bear. And like that at that moment, um, I'm 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 perked up. What you have a bear? Okay, <laughs> like yeah. and and that is absolutely thought out. Like that that aside, that not and also he also, you know, Letterman when I was still there, he he did Lyle the intern, or the guy yeah, would just come Lyle out and like intern. smoke and like like he, and you can tell Letterman loves that smoke and call him names and like, <laughs> right. like uh, yeah. It, so I, I like those non sequiturs. That contain the contain not yeah, that, that contain not yeah. Yeah. When you leave the onion, you go straight to Late Night with Seth Meyers. It's a new show. Well, first I was at Comedy Bang Bang. I t- I, That's yeah. right. You took a hiatus from the onion yeah, to I do took, Comedy Bang Bang. And I did I did Comedy Bang Bang in LA for like four months. And how was working on that show? Great. Scott Ackerman was great. It was a good you know, a lot of those three month, four month gigs, they might not be it was a, it was a perfect thing for me to do and there's some wackiness a lot of wackiness extreme some of the most extreme you're going to get in this country probably yes and he was also making fun i mean i i like making fun of the stuff that's kind of stupid like the talk show format that we've become so used to it and that when it changes it's people are like this is insane is crazy it is crazy. And the it's way crazy. They, they'll change it like one percent yeah and, and people like, go like, he's what? really breaking the, the barriers the <laughs> yeah and like Scott's show early on was sort of like his Letterman show early on was really making fun of that sort of, it was poking at that, that, uh, what's the word? Um, just that format. He was poking at that format and Scott really, the early on was poking at the format. Now he's, he doesn't, the show has evolved in a great way where it kind of does that, but it's also telling stories throughout the episodes and my, I wrote for season two. I think that's when they re, they started sort of making having story arcs throughout the episodes. But it was it was great, and um, 
he was wonderful to work with and the, the writers room there were great. I worked with a lot of guys who were in this group called the birthday boys who had ended up having a show on IFC and they were just fantastic. Um, it was good for me to do. The onion was nice enough to let me do it. And then after that, I came back to Chicago and worked at the onion a little longer and then got late night. Yep. Yeah. So tell us about how it is working on late night. You went in as a, um, a charter writer, right? It was like yes. a new yeah. show. Yeah. So were you part of the conversations of what the show was going to be and what kind of humor it's going to You know have? what? I, I think we never had conversations about what is this show. I think it was just, let's start pitching ideas and we'll start doing the show. I mean, there was, I think Seth, Seth has a certain, um, Seth has a certain voice that meshes well with my voice. Uh, he, he's really good at talking to the camera and he's smart. So people buy that from him when he's talking about an issue. He's also very good at playing straight man to insanity. And there's, and he has a certain intelligence where I think, I just think our, our tastes really overlap in a lot of nice ways. And there are certain areas where our tastes do not overlap. And then it's kind of figuring out, well, in this where our taste doesn't overlap, how can I kind of bring it to where it will? Um, no, I mean, we, you know, we, I think we just started doing the show. I mean, with the knowledge of who Seth was as a person. But I, it's not like we were really great at writing for Seth immediately. And we're probably not. We're still not. I mean, he's, he's his best. He is a writer. He is his best writer. And that... Um, he's his best writer, and then probably second best is Alex Bays, who's our head writer, and he wrote for Seth, who did Weekend Update. Uh, he was the head writer of Weekend Update. So he, so there, he's his best writer, and I think we're still sort of figuring it out. Does stuff get rewritten a lot, or is it? Uh... Yeah, everything goes. Uh, you know, the stuff that's really good really doesn't get rewritten that much, but this, everything that you see on the show goes through Seth. He's very much a part of the process, and I'm not just saying that because it's a good. PR thing to say he's he's very much a part of the process and I don't think his personality will allow him not to be and that's the same thing if if I were hosting a show my personality wouldn't allow me to just be like okay I'll say the words like that's not yeah he's got to make him his own yeah does he go back to the group for a lot of punch up and is there a lot of group work on stuff once it's ready to go no I think once it's ready to go the next time it gets, we'll put it up in front of like a test audience, uh, a monologue. It's called the monologue audience. And then from where do there. The, where do those people come from? They are tourists who are trying to buy, who are in the, trying to buy NBC memorabilia. And they are, okay. and they are rounded up and they are brought up to a studio. And if they can speak English, great. <laughs> uh, yeah. And if they can't speak English, I'm so happy that they get to judge the comedy bits we've worked on for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> I'm curious to know if that fire still burns in you to do comedy now that it's your day job and it's your career. And by many standards of measure, you've made it. You know, you're a professional, Oof. successful Oof. comedy writer. Yeah. That, that makes you cringe. Oof. Oh, what, yeah, it does. What, uh, you know, what's left to accomplish so much for you a lot there's a lot that i'd like to do what and would you like to do i get overwhelmed by it um i'd like to do something that's my own thing <clears throat> i've sort of worked within these institutions um for a while and i've made them my own but through the lens of the creator when I write sort of McSweeney's pieces or New Yorker pieces, that's me in my purest form. I'd like to do that. I'd like to broadcast that. And, you know, I'd, I'd like to write a show. That said, whenever, we, whenever I start thinking about writing a show or a movie, I don't think they would be comedies. Um, what would they be? I think they'd be dramedies. I when I whenever I think about writing a movie, the movie that comes like movies that come to my mind immediately are like Sideways, Nebraska. I don't think I could write Step Brothers. Um, I I think they're funny. I couldn't do it. I couldn't. I don't think I could write Anchorman. Um, 
those just aren't the store like the things that immediately pop into my head of things I would want to talk about. Hmm. Um, like I have one movie idea for sort of a lawyer who's facing retirement, and I'm like, well, this is a Golden Globe Globe nomination for Tommy Lee Jones if he wants to do it. Totally. So this is going to be this yeah, is going to be Paul Will Newman Fair. got one yeah, <laughs> so his like, retiring lawyer <laughs> movie. Um, so I'd like to do something like that. Comedy-wise, though, I mean, there's, like I said, there's a, a web series that I'd like to do, and whatever happens with that, great. But I'd like to produce it and be in some, and I feel like I could churn out a lot of them. I, Whenever you're starting from a place, I like, a, I like, like I said, I like absurdity, and that's I think that's hard to do. It's hard to do in, like, a 30-minute chunk when you have to worry about story, you know, I think I'm not good at that. I'm not, I, when I, when I watch television, I usually watch dramas. Um, as 30 rock is really funny, but I, I don't necessarily, I would never, I don't know how much I want to worry about how we get Liz Lemon from point A to point B. Yeah. They did a great job of having the minimal amount of story you needed, right. but still get really absurd. Right. And a lot of people thought that was, you know, what wasn't working on the show. But to me, that's what made the show so special. Um, the, the absurdity. But I, I also understand the importance in that of hanging, you need the story to hang your hat on. I get that. Yeah, if you just did wackiness for 30 right. minutes, people would be bored stiff. <laughs> right. So I think in a comedy context, I'm great in four to five minute bursts in sections of those. That's when I think I'm at my best comedy wise. Web series, therefore. Web series are, you know, if there's some sort of, way you can find a th thematically find a way that it could work on a comedy central or something like that. Yeah. Or the, you know, there's sketch shows, <coughs> right. obviously something like Python did an amazing job of figuring out really unique ways to structure each show. Right. So it and didn't that have to have like. a plot, but right. it would have a structure and the through I like, yeah, I, amazing I, I, work there. Yes. Um, and yeah. I don't know if you could even get away with that in America. I mean, they, there are a lot of sketch shows now and they all kind of do their own thing. Right. And they're sort of a genre. And I think there's a way that you're expected to do it. In America, right, right. But what do I know? Um, but then you know, Mr. Show did sort of did that Monty Python thing, and yep. um, I feel like now there's pr one thing I and I know he's he's my he's my boss, so this sounds like I'm a shill, but the show there's a show on IFC now called Documentary Now. Have you seen it? I have not seen. You it. You would love it. it. You I'll would have love to it. check it out because everything is played straight. It's parodies of famous documentaries. There's nothing like it on American television. It feels like a British show. It really does. And it stars Bill Hader and Fred Armisen, but it also casts a lot of normal looking people to fill out like a cop feels like a cop. And it's they're delivering these lines and they're really funny. It's excellent. It's so good. And Seth Meyers produced the show. Uh, yeah, he did along with uh, Bill Hader and Fred Armisen. That's and a good tip. They're, it's an excellent show. I'm, when I watched it, I was like, oh my God. I was, I was like jealous. When I heard the concept, I was jealous. And then when I watched the show, I was more jealous because I, like, this is great. This is, I would love to do something like this. That's, and it's good because it's telling a story a little bit, but it's, it's telling a story, but the characters are all very funny and the talking to camera stuff is all, it's used really well. And that's probably what I'd be best at writing for in terms of like episodic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that web series you did for the Onion, the uh, the stay in history. With yes. The Onion, yeah. I was very much like that. Yeah. It was. Yeah. It was. And I and I loved playing with. What I liked about it too is the the professor character. We could he could play and he could perform, and I liked his performance. He was so good. Yeah. Such a weirdo. And he was really funny. Yeah. Great. Uh, well, best of luck with all that stuff, Seth. Thanks, Scott. It's been a pleasure chatting with How you. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having <laughs> I know. <no> problem. <laughs>